Old Dirty Bastard was one of the biggest rap stars during the mid 90s and from the outside looking in it looked like they lived a happy and rich lifestyle but this was far away from the truth. This video will take a deeper look into the life of Russell Jones. This is the ODB story. Russell Tyrone Jones, known as Old Dirty Bastard, was born in Brooklyn in 1968 and grew up on the streets of Fourth Green. His home was a musical one, and his dad had records of every type of music, which influenced ODB along with his siblings. And with their imagination, Russell and his older brother started a fictional band. ODB played the drums using coat hangers as drumsticks, and his brother played the guitar with a broomstick. During this time in Brooklyn, there was a big movement going on, influenced by Islam. They were called the Five Percenters, and the basic principle is that 10% of people know the truth of existence, 85% of people are ignorant and therefore controlled by the 10%, and the remaining 5% know the truth of existence, but instead of using it against others, they use it to enlighten the 85%. It's also based on the idea that black men are gods and black women are earths. The 5% nation even had a system called Supreme Mathematics, which became the dedication of a lot of people in the ghetto, including Older the Bastard and his two cousins, the Rizza and the Jizza. And it led them to self-sustainability, self-understanding and dignity. Through the teachings, they all became closer to each other, but they also shared two other common interests, hip-hop and kung fu flicks. They would battle people in the Bronx and so on, as well as performing on live shows just for the love of hip hop. And they even created a group together. They were named All In Together Crew and they made a record with the same name. And at this point, they had no idea it would be the early foundations of the Wu-Tang Clan. Sit in my class. Part of the coaches. Do that shit right class. now. Yeah, ready? Sit in my class, you can hear me? You hear me? One, two, one, two, yo. Sitting in my class at a quarter to ten. Wait impatiently for the class to begin. The teacher says, students, open up your text and read the first paragraph on Oru's. When I said red, just said go. go. But you should have stopped because the red was the bloodshed. But you ignored the warning and you went ahead and tried me, G, by setting up a match, a oh, fair man, one, man, meaning man. no strings attached and bang. No. The Wu consisted of the Rizza, the Jizza, Older, the Bastard, Inspector, Deck, Raekwon, the Chef, Yu God, Ghostface, Killer, Master Killer, and the Method Man. They brought something unique to the world that hadn't been seen before. Their sound, lyrics, styles of rhyming were different, along with their martial arts approach to hip hop, such as Older, the Bastard taking his name from the Kung Fu movie Older, the Kung Fu which is about the drunken master and his many adventures, which is pretty fitting for Jones himself. Wu-Tang represents a sword style of rhyming, man. The Wu is the way, the Tang is the slang, the clan represents the family, man. We call it a sword style because we are lyrical assassins and we are aware that the tongue is symbolic to the sword. In October of 1992, the group recorded the single Protect Your Neck and it wasn't until December it was picked up by the radio, which made the clan able to enter the music business, which got them signed to Loud Records, where they released Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers, along with ODB signing to Electro Records, releasing his first album in 1995, Return to the 36 Chambers, the dirty version, with his own welfare card as the album cover. It consisted of singles like Brooklyn Zoo, Shimmy Shimmy Ya, which earned the album gold. And at that same year, he was featured on Mariah Carey's Fantasy Remix. It became a huge success, along with being one of the first crossovers between popular pop, R&B and hip-hop. ODB became a star. There was no father to his style, with his offbeat, half-rapped, half-song delivery, along with his explicit lyrics and entertaining personality. For instance, one of his many antics around this time was that he collected a welfare check by a limousine. And you might remember when Kanye West crashed the Grammys. And you might believe he's the only one to do so. But that's where you're dead wrong. In 1997, Wu-Tang's second album was released. It was titled Wu-Tang Forever and it was their most commercially successful. And due to the success, they got nominated to the Grammys. However, they didn't win, which didn't sit quite right with one of the Wu-Tang members. 
I went and bought me an outfit today that costed a lot of money today. You know what I mean? Because I figured that Wu-Tang was going to win. I don't know how y'all see it, but when it comes to the children, Wu-Tang is for the children. We teach the children. You know what I mean? Puffy is good, but Wu-Tang is the best. Okay? I want y'all to know that this is ODB and I love you all. Peace. But the fame would soon go to his head which started a downward spiral of self-destructive behavior. Around this time, he was experimenting with a lot of drugs. He had problems paying child support. He pleaded guilty for attempted assault. He got shot in a robbery. He was arrested for shoplifting, along with making terrorist threats. He also thought the CIA was out to get him. And due to the paranoia, he had to wear a bulletproof vest, which also got him arrested. And somehow, during all this drama, he also managed to release an album in 1999 with the hit song Got Your Money, which was produced by the Neptunes. However, his luck to avoid prison started to run out in 2000. He decided to escape rehab, becoming a fugitive from the law. And in secret, he recorded new material with the RZA. Eventually, ODB was caught while signing autographs at a McDonald's parking lot. And at this time, he was sentenced from two to four years in state prison. And his contract with Electro Records was terminated. Nonetheless, the prison was terrible for ODB. He was assaulted countless times, he had mental issues, and he felt abandoned by the Wu-Tang Clan. And when he came out on parole, it was something different about him. He wasn't there like he was before, and even his mom telling the media the prison killed him. Despite his ill mental state, he continued his music career, signing a contract with Rockefeller Records the same day he was released, and he directly started to work on his new music. But the past had already caught up to him, and on the 13th of November 2004, Odebi collapsed while recording at Rissa Studio, which ended in his tragic death. And he was there, man. You know what I mean? But he had a smile on his face. Like, he had a face of bravery. Like, like this is where I want to go right now, my nigga. The year was 1998. And ODB was working at his record studio in Brooklyn. And outside his window, he witnessed a car accident. As soon as he saw the incident, he and his friends ran out from the studio and lifted the car of the four-year-old child that had been hit. The young four-year-old was later taken to the hospital with third-degree burns. And while recovering, ODB continued to frequently visit her, even using a fake name just to get the chance to meet her. This shows what kind of person Jones was. Everything he did was from the heart.